Welcome to Crying Out Cloud, a podcast that will make you laugh, cry, and reconsider all of your cloud security fears. I'm Eden from the CTO team at Wiz, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily Tai, um, from the threat research team at Wiz. And we are doing a very uh, special episode on a big incident that took place over the weekend which is a backdoor in XC utils that allows for an RCE. Um, You've probably heard about it because it's been buzzing around. So our goal is to give you everything you need to know and walk you through what went down and what you should do about it. Shall we? We shall. Cool. So the bottom line is that there last two versions of XC utils contain a backdoor that is 5.6.0 and 5.6.1 um and what happened was a backdoor was discovered um in XC utils which is a compression software package that's used in a bunch of different linux distributions and it was found by a microsoft engineer that was doing tests on efficiency not even security And he had a feeling that it was working slowly, which was really, really keen because it was working only like 500 milliseconds slow. Where others may have ignored this, he didn't. Um, He suspected that something weird was going on, looked into the code and saw that something truly was weird um, and kind of fishy. So he looked into the commit history and the project where he saw even weirder things. what did he find? A backdoor. I mean, Ty, can you tell them what this backdoor um, was? So that is still up for debate. The main theories at the moment are that it would have allowed someone to bypass authentication on SSH, um, on internet connected machines, but it's possible it allowed something a bit more elaborate. It's possible that there were certain conditions that we still haven't discovered that only allowed this to be exploited under you know, really certain conditions that only the attacker was aware of, you know, maybe there was some encryption going on and, um, you know, maybe the attacker is the only one who has the key. Anyway, a lot of open questions at the moment, but bottom line, uh, the assumption is that, um, the attacker wanted this out there so that they could gain remote code execution on machines of their choosing. Interesting. Um, who was the account behind this? Who is the um, mastermind of this backdoor. So um, the account on the open source project that uh, that did these uh, these fishy things um, was created in 2021. Um, it has done a few things since then, but most of its activity was focused uh, on the XEUtils project. Um, it's hard to say at the moment if this was a real person or not. It might have been like a sock puppet account that the threat actor behind this uh, set up, you know, solely for this purpose. Um, It might be a real purpose and they're just, it might might be a real person and they might just have, you know, very, very private lives that don't have any appearance on the internet. Um, But at the moment, nobody really knows who's behind this. There are a lot of theories going around. It, some of this activity is similar to things that North Korean threat actors have done. Some of it is similar to what Chinese threat actors have done. Um, uh, it's all very effective and it's all very sophisticated. And it has a lot of social engineering behind it. Yeah. So like the, the, the main point of interest here, and I think one of the reasons that people are, are really um, worked up about this, um, justifiably so, is that, you know, this project had one maintainer for a long time. Um, they admit uh, that they had, you know, mental health issues that were, preventing them from giving the project as much attention that they, as they would have liked. Um, you know, people were complaining to them, like, you know, why don't you invest more time in this project? And they was, and they were like, but this is, this is a hobby, you know, this isn't something I get paid for, uh, which is a problem with a lot of open source software. You know, people yeah. spend, you know, their blood and tears and sweat on, on these projects. They don't get paid a dime and everybody expects them to, you know, to, to, to work on it as though it's uh, their full-time job. And someone came along and, uh, exploited this guy's trust and convinced them that they could be of help on the project. Well, wait, um, 
asterisk mark is not only did that were all these other users around also were chiming in yeah kind of create either a facade or something to kind of really make the main maintainer kind of give in to having additional help yeah so like again at this point it's there's not really proof that these were also sock puppet accounts but it is kind of weird that they're only commenting on this project and not really having much activity elsewhere. So it kind of it kind of makes sense that this is something a threat actor would do. Like if they wanted to convince someone to uh, give them access and, and and gain their trust, this is that would be a very smart thing to do. Like have a bunch of other people come up and say like, "Yo, bro, you suck," you know, and like then they, you know, they they get sad and and classic and, uh, kids bullying at a schoolyard, but GitHub style. GitHub style and and yeah and 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 espionage uh, espionage organization style yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so all in all, they waited two years to insert insert the back door, which is um, to give them a compliment. Quite patient. Uh, <laughs> so they waited around for two years. They inserted this back door, and now we actually don't know how much this was. Um, leveraged. Yeah. So, uh, thanks to the Microsoft engineer who discovered this, it was only you know out there for I think like a, a few weeks uh, prior to being discovered. It's possible that they didn't even achieve their goals, right? Like we're, we we don't know at this point if the backdoor ended up where it was supposed to be, if they were able to exploit this. But yeah, they waited a long time. It's possible that some of their earlier commits were also uh, malicious in nature, you know. Since they had so much time to work on this, you know, they might have been sort of scattering tiny vulnerabilities here and there, uh, wherever they had access. One interesting thing they did that people noticed uh, pretty quick is they also submitted a PR to OSS Fuzz, uh, which is a Google project that people use to test for vulnerabilities in open source software. Um, and they had their commit accepted, and the commit it essentially neutralized um, this fuzzer, fuzzer's ability to identify what they had done with this backdoor, which is really smart. And again, you know, they gain someone's trust. They prove that they are, they look like a real person that is doing real uh, open source work. Um, they're part of the community. Um, and uh, they were really smart about it. Fascinating. So I think also living to the fact that they did it really well, there's not much that can be done to prevent it. Like in theory, that there's, um, you know, you can calculate reputation of packages. Um, but in this case, they did a lot of work to make it not look so suspicious. Yeah. <clears throat> um, like, it, it, it's kind of sad to say, but there really isn't much you can do to defend yourself, to, to defend yourself against this kind of attack. Um, like, if you are just an organization that is using computers, right, um, you're going to be using something that is sourced from some place that you can't actually check yourself. There is too much code in modern computers to actually, you know, run tests against on your own. Um, there's a lot of reliance on open source. Open source isn't inherently more secure or less secure than closed source. The only advantage is that when it's open, um, there are no secrets. Anybody can take a look and figure out what happened, uh, which was a very good thing in this case. Um, there are things that can make this harder. For example, um, you can use things like the Open Source Software Foundation scorecard, which sort of gives you metrics for how at risk is a repository. In general, that you should calculate the reputation of packages, um, which is something in theory we should do to be able to avoid things of this nature, but they did a really good job um, obscuring that um, so there wasn't anything that was glaringly suspicious um, so interesting what you do about this yeah like you know you could say let's audit all uh, packages that have a lot of dependencies um, across you know multiple Linux distributions that are in use in a lot of other software where only one maintainer is active in the project, but there are a lot of those, you know? Um, so it kind of becomes like a numbers game of what do you actually prioritize for auditing? What do you prioritize for funding? Like some of these projects 
are essentially critical infrastructure at this point in the sense that they are used in critical infrastructure uh, computing. Um, they should be getting money. Someone should be funding this. Someone should be helping them review their code. Um, it becomes sort of an, an industry problem. It's not something that users can solve on their own, you know, each to their own, right? Okay. So what you should do about this, since we can't solve the whole problem overnight, is make sure you're downgraded to a version before 5.6 of XCUtils. Um, that's the first thing you should definitely do. Um, follow along with Linux distribution advisories. Definitely keep doing that. Um, and what should you do if you were using an affected version? That's a really good question. So CISA has advised people that were using the affected version to kind of just, you know, look at their logs, check for weird stuff, but that's kind of generic advice and there's really not much you can do with that. Like it does make sense to to look at machines that had the, the, the affected version installed and try to see if you can see anything weird. Um, but if you don't really know what you're looking for and you don't really know what the exploit looked like, you don't really know what the purpose of all this was, then it's really going to be really hard to figure out um, if there's actually been exploitation uh, in your network. Um, I will say that it does make sense to try to check, but it's not like you can run a test and if the test shows no results, then you can say, ah, I must be okay. Um, so I would say, you know, best effort, check for weird stuff in your network, check for weird stuff on machines where they, where they had this installed and were exposed to the internet and had SSH uh, enabled. And, you know, wait a bit, for more conclusions to come out and to people to better understand how this thing worked and how it was exploited so that you know what to look for and then run those tests again uh, by well fine-tuning them to uh, to those conclusions. Yes. Um, probably follow the Wiz blog because really, really helpful, very thorough work is being published there. Um, and that's all. For this episode of Crying Out Cloud, presented by this special episode, very of Crying special Out episode, Cloud. Um, presented by the cloud security company Wiz. If you enjoyed the show um, and you want to continue to get updates as big news hits the cloud, be sure to subscribe and share a link to the podcast, but not your cloud keys. And as always, if your cloud security strategy is making you cry, don't worry, just cry out cloud. Thank you.